I stand before you today fully awake, but I dream the dream of Jesus, of Muhammad, of Gandhi, of Martin Luther King, and every spiritual and religious leader have come before us. Hello, and it's a great pleasure to I welcome back dream. Reverend David Coleman with the United Reformed Church. He holds the title of environmental chaplain, which is a quite unusual post. And in that responsibility as an environmental chaplain, I wonder if you found, David, in the other Christian faith communities, are there specific moments within the year where the natural environment or sustainability is highlighted through a festival or religious service or is it really more like a stream that flows through scripture and through practice all year long? What are your thoughts? Mm. Well, picking up on the, the watery metaphor there, I, I made a wee film a, a little while ago, uh, which I called Fish in Water. Uh, fish is the traditional identification of Christians when they were under pressure, when they were prohibited, they used to use a little fish as a, as a secret sign. Um, and what I was trying to get across there was that, yes, I mean, we are within a, a highly environmental stream, but it's invisible in plain sight most mm. of the time. So probably the starting point might be that many, many churches and other places have something like a harvest festival where uh, the good things of the earth, which again, in Christianity, should obviously say something to us about the goodness of God, mm -hmm. Are, are in your face. Um, when I, I, I've got getting on for 25 years of, of local grassroots ministry, and in some of the places I used to work, people would bring out and place a piece of coal on the, on the table. Uh, I like to celebrate Holy Communion on harvest because, you know, again, bringing all the good things together. And, and recently people have said, oh dear, we'd better not put that coal there. But, you know, previously they'd brought it because it was to represent th their labor, you know, sure. that people had worked hard to, to keep things going. Then people, go and I actually put it there because it shows the, the ambiguity of where we are, that we are, um, I mean, all the wonderful environmental initiatives that you might get recommended to you, all of them have a downside. Nothing is perfect. Um, and at the same time, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're a faith that looks to God to finish things off, not to us. Mm. And so in the midst of climate crisis, we need to wean people off the idea that we will fix it. So you really see this as an integral practice of faith and spirituality, that while we might highlight this at a harvest festival or in my own Jewish tradition in February with Tu B'Shvat, the festival yeah. of the trees, the new year of the trees, it really is something that faith communities can integrate all year. So how does the faith and spirituality communities demonstrate best practices in environmental sustainability? And I'll go back to the three R's, starting with reduction, reuse, recycling. What are some best practices you've seen local churches and others use? I, I think let people see that you enjoy what you do. Hmm. Uh, I've, I mean, there are, for instance, uh, churches I've visited on Scottish islands, and they've gone into litter picking. And it helped, they can see it does some good, hmm. everybody else appreciates it, and it actually builds them up in confidence, um, and, and makes them more interested, more open to see what else they can do. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get, um, through our networks, um, you know, advice on how to make sure that the places where you meet are as energy efficient as possible, which, you know, might in the long term even, even please the treasurer. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you, you can demonstrate best practice by finding out what best practice is, not in reinventing the wheel, but as you do so, bring both humility in learning, but assertiveness in saying this is who we are, we are not irrelevant. Mm. We're actually, you know, part of everything else that is going. So if I hear you, you're suggesting that one size doesn't fit all. You have to not find all. what works for your church community. Well, let me ask you a question. The churches are getting ready in phase two of our coming out of lockdown to reopen 
for individual worship, right? Mm, so, some of them, yes. So this means you're opening a building. Maybe you're going to have to heat that building mm. uh, in the in the winter time for one or two people to sit in the pews. What would be an example of a church that might please the community as well as the treasurer mm. to help welcome people back to the churches? Uh, I think we've all of us been through a time now which is not just a blip. Um, if we haven't learned something from these last couple of months, then, you know, we've been wasting God's time. Mm. Um, the idea, yes, I mean, I've, I've been in my training. I remember there was, there was a church I was asked to go and preach at, uh, and unfortunately somebody had left them a legacy, which meant they could heat a 500-seat church for five people. Mm. Um, we have to realize, I think, God never restores although you know restore is a word that comes uh, in the book of job which again my tradition would share with yours at the end of that time job's getting on a bit he's got beautiful daughters he's got possessions mm -hmm. but none of what he's lost is ever brought back mm -hmm. um, uh, churches and other faith communities are actually custodians of mortality mm -hmm. um, we are realistic that life has its limits uh, and this is quite subversive in a culture that says there is no limit. Uh, dear old Ronald Reagan, I believe, said there's no limit to growth because there's no limit to human imagination. You know, saying just going against everything we've been taught that God alone is without limits. Mm -hmm. um, we find our place. Uh, uh, Paul wrote to a church which was thought it was the bee's knees, you know, when I am weak, then I'm strong. If we accept that we cannot sort everything out, then we find out what our influence and power actually is. Hmm. What do you think we might learn, David, from technologies like the ones we're using today going forward in terms of helping the environment with worship services? For example, we've studied at the Edinburgh Interfaith Association the attendance online versus in the pew and yeah. online it's significantly higher yes a part of that is because the pews have been closed but once the pews reopen mm. and mass gatherings are allowed in churches etc do you think some services can shift to the online presence as a way of maybe promoting more environmental sustainability it's possible we might have a sort of hybrid approach because, you know, face-to-face -face -face is a gold standard of sorts, mm -hmm. but we're quite a long way off standard face-to-face -face now. Um, almost all the administrative meetings of the church, I think, can, from now on uh, and other, can be online now. Mm -hmm. um, small, even very small local faith communities have learnt how to do this, they've got confident in it in a way they absolutely would not have got round to mm -hmm. uh, if, if we hadn't had uh, these things happen. So, uh, and, and that's, you know, you have to be careful you're not gleeful about disaster, but also not waste the learning opportunities of it. So things will continue, things will develop, I, I do hope. Um, and certainly, you know, we, we had in Eco Congregation our annual gathering online which was, as you say, better attended <laughs> than ever it previously had been. Um, these technologies are a gift. Um, I, I, we do have to be wary of two things. One is the traditional, oh, you're using technology, you must be doing something unholy. Mm. People have hearing aids, people have organs to play for music. We've been, you know, people have been printing books for a few hundred years. Technology, in a way, is more or less neutral. It's whether you use it in a just way or not. Mm. And, I, you know, let's keep justice in this because that's got to be integral to, to faith, that it isn't just about looking after yourself, but looking... Um, if I, I just keep rabbiting on a second. Go ahead, please. People have, people have taken part in corporate worship mm -hmm. who have been housebound, who, have, who would have found the usual situation impossible because they have anxiety or mental health issues. So 
people are included at the same time we acknowledge that people who haven't quite got their heads around the technology will be feeling a bit grumpy and shut out but swings and roundabouts so it's also a way to expand the footprint of faith and spirituality without mm -hmm. necessarily increasing the environmental damage although so, there is an argument you know that the computer server farms every time you turn on a computer that it is um, affecting the ozone layer and so on as compared to getting in your car and driving as my parents used to do with me 45 minutes to the synagogue and Ooh. back each day you know it's yeah. much easier to do this online mm. i have one more question for you today what may the faith community do in the future to better educate others about the importance of environmental sustainability so how can we as members of a faith or spiritual community become prophets ourselves, role models for future generations through education? In two or three ways. First of all is owning up that we are part of it. Um, the prophet Jeremiah was a man of unclean lips amongst a people of unclean lips. Um, you know, don't pretend that you're perfect. Be down there with everybody else, but at the same time, do your best. Mm -hmm. Let it be clear to people that if you're people of faith, you are, that goes automatically with care for creation. Um, just to take the wee example of Sterling Methodist Church I visited, next to their notice board, they've got a bird feeder. Just saying other, other creatures are welcome in God's sight as well as us. Let that somehow become taken for granted that faith goes with care for creation. And for that, you have to look at what you're doing in your own lives, in your own festivals, um, Church of South India, they moved on, for instance, from lighting a lamp at a wedding to planting a tree at a wedding. So you're still doing something beautiful and holy, but it's, it's giving a different message. Thank you so very much. My guest today has been Reverend David Coleman with the United Reformed Church. He's the eco-chaplain for Scotland and across many denominations. David, if you're happy, to have people contact you to speak at their synagogue, mosque, temple, church, or place of worship, what's the best way to reach you? Probably via the um, Eco Congregation Scotland website or via my um, additional Facebook page called Eco Chaplain Online. Um, at present, all I am doing is, uh, I'd say, real but also online. So I'm working with local churches supporting their worship or sometimes offering uh, a thought or a reflection or a talk. So I'm, I will either, I will take part as we're doing now or and or record uh, something which they can then use uh, as part of their own event. Thank you. Well, I would encourage our viewers to contact David and invite him to your next Zoom webinar or Skype program so that he can share his important message about the environment with your fellow community members. David, I mentioned in our previous interview that I'm a big fan of one of the greatest Americans ever to walk the earth, Chief yeah. Seattle, who famously told us, as you know, that uh, the earth does not belong to us, we belong to the earth. I am so glad that you chose to come to Scotland and to help us better understand the connections between faith, spirituality, and the natural environment. We are a better country for your presence here. And so on behalf of the Interfaith Association of Edinburgh, please let me thank you for sharing your time with us today and helping us keep the faith. Pleasure. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome.